I'm very happy to be here on Coffee with Cornelius with my close friend. I'm here with Richard Richard. Richard is a lawyer in England. He is a lecturer in law as well at Liverpool John Moores University in Liverpool. He went to that institution for his undergraduate degree in law, and he attained a graduate degree, a BCL in law, from the University of Oxford with distinction. And by, and that's, by the way, where we met. We were both um, at Keeble College together. How are you doing, Richard? I'm very well. Thank you very much for the warm introduction and yeah. welcome. And it's great to be on with you. I'd like this to be a little bit of a semi-regular thing where Richard and I talk about various issues of interest, especially at the intersection of law and economics. Uh, over the coming weeks in this podcast, over the coming uh, year, years, hopefully, <laughs> if this podcast lasts that long, uh, because Richard is somebody who does have a unique take on various uh, interesting issues from financial regulation to the topic that we're going to be talking about today, which is Indigenous law in Canada and the history of Indigenous law in Canada and how it's laid out. So uh, before we do that, before we get into the subject matter, I'd just like to make a few notes for the audience. First of all, neither of us are really experts in this issue. This is just something that we have an interest in. This is more going to be a basic rundown of the legal issues facing First Nations land claims and other kinds of issues for First Nations people in Canada. Uh, it's not going to be a deep dive. It's going to be a very basic analysis. And in terms of terminology, when we use the word Indigenous, we're going to use it interchangeably with Indian just because of the nature of the historical language that was used. The Indian Act, for example, the language for that hasn't changed. Richard, I'd like to just ask you to start us out here. What's the motivation for today's topic, at least from your perspective? And what's, what do you, why do you think this is important at all? Why is this an important subject mm -hmm. for Canadians especially to talk about, of course, because it affects our land claims, but why is this important for mm -hmm. British people to know about? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that fundamentally we're talking about human rights mm. and human rights issues affect all of us in one way or another. Uh, but often human rights are there to protect those most vulnerable in society. And there seems to be quite a permissive view on perception that in many developed countries, uh, there are no issues when it comes to society that for the UK, for instance, we have the Human Rights Act um, and therefore uh, the, there are no further issues. But if we probe a little bit deeper, uh, actually we can uncover quite a few issues facing particular groups. And in Canada, uh, which we're going to be talking about today, uh, it's going to be the indigenous population there whom often we have seen throughout the years uh, the rights of in the indigenous people in Canada literally have at times a railroad through uh, their rights and lands uh, and also we see their rights being affected in all manner of different ways uh, throughout history in the legislation uh, that, that we'll come on to talk in a bit more detail um, and the degree and the extent to which they have been uh, consulted uh, with various different uh, communities in, in the indigenous population uh, and uh, the subsequent developments from that because social mores change uh, throughout time and law should very much reflect that and quite often that's a political decision and political judgments that is being made at any given time and so it's very interesting to think about what sort of debate and interaction there are uh, that takes place at the various different levels and uh, this is a very good example to explore such issues uh, in indigenous rights. Uh, yeah that's very well said. I wonder you know especially now today I think that a lot of these issues of human rights even come to the fore in recent history and we'll get to this in more detail later. Mm -hmm. To what extent do you think that the agreements over land between the Canadian government and the indigenous people have or have not been successfully wrought over, has successfully fought over, or successfully mm -hmm. bar. I, I don't want to say fought, I would rather say uh, settled over. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it used to be uh, the case uh, that communities 
would be very autonomous uh, mm -hmm. hundreds of years ago. Uh, and then there was a view that there should be much greater assimilation uh, with communities to uh, the wider society. And what we've seen over time has been uh, a greater harmonization, um, which in some ways can be an imposition of the greater mm. society over uh, more uh, smaller communities. Uh, Almost and, kind of a paternalistic view of the First Nations people. Yes, I, I'd agree with that. And uh, it's, and obviously that will change uh, depending on what the government at the time is. Uh, and if you think about it purely from a political point of view, uh, with the population so small of the indigenous uh, population and certainly voting population as well, you would not see it being uh, a terrifically high priority issue when it comes to political campaigning. You think of uh, cynically how many votes realistically could possibly be won by saying our top agenda is uh, having a much fairer agreement with indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. And with more recent events, uh, and we, we think about what's been happening in America with certain communities there. And we see a bit more attention now and a bit more of a magnifying glass over the actions of governments and also state actors uh, when it comes to the indigenous population in Canada. Uh, and that's going to be very interesting to see how it develops. But I think you're right in saying that uh, we can describe it as a very much a paternalistic view of a government at any given time and whatever is also most politically convenient for mm -hmm. them as well at any given time. Yeah, I think you make a good point there. They're not a big uh, proportion of the population of Canada. And to be honest, they're quite spread out over all of Canada, right? You see them in the cities. I think 70% of uh, Aboriginal people in Canada, Indigenous people in Canada live in cities and then 30% on these rural reserves and these reserves rarely carry the weight of an election. And so I don't think there's much incentive for governments to act upon these issues. Now, when it comes to the government's relationship, the Canadian government's relationship with Indigenous people, the first piece of legislation that any person needs to talk about is the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which is actually a British piece of legislation. Tell us a little bit about this Royal Proclamation of 1763 and why it is important. Well, it was the very first uh, attempt, really, uh, to assimilate uh, uh, indigenous people uh, to wider society and to guarantee in uh, modern law, if you like, uh, at the time, uh, the rights and various positions when it comes to the indigenous population. And as you say, uh, that it was uh, very much directed from Britain. Um, and the reason for that would be because of the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to bear in mind that uh, under the Commonwealth common law legal system, uh, quite often we do see and have seen throughout history uh, various developments in law that have uh, emanated from Britain that have subsequently been applied in other common law jurisdictions. And you'll notice... Uh, so the Queen is basically the sovereign and therefore legal principles and articles are affected by virtue of the sovereign in, invested in the sovereign in England. Yes, that's correct. Uh, mm -hmm. Our sovereign head of state is the, the Queen uh, and... Uh, whenever we see any uh, legislation uh, that needs to be passed through uh, both the, the Parliament and, and House of Lords and the upper chamber, ultimately it still resides the power with the Queen. It needs royal assent yeah. uh, and it needs the approval and the signature uh, of the head of state, i.e. today, the Queen. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we can't have legislation going through uh, without that. So at the time, uh, back in, in the 1700s, you would see that uh, the monarchy would probably be exerting a bit more power than, than we see these days. <laughs> I think so, yeah. uh, it, It's more symbolic today. Uh, but back then, you think of yeah. the power influence uh, that a monarchy in, in Britain would wield uh, with... with uh, the Commonwealth countries and uh, many more visits and interactions uh, and uh, 
moreover influence that's being exerted in the Commonwealth nations. I don't think we see uh, that to, to any great extent these days, other than the remnants of history, i.e. Uh, the common law system. And I think the reason why countries such as Canada and Australia and others may not have decided to divert from common law uh, is because fundamentally it works and your other option is the civil law jurisdiction system. The French kind system. of system. Yes, French and German uh, style systems uh, and probably being biased myself, uh, I much prefer the, the common law uh, system in, in, in many different aspects. Uh, say, say for a few. So can so we back up a little bit and talk mm -hmm. about what exactly does the Royal Proclamation say in terms of Indigenous land? Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of Indigenous land, it's tied up with various other rights and recognitions of status. And the Royal Proclamation uh, was uh, quite, seemed to be quite controversial if we're looking back retrospectively uh, of that. Uh, and essentially what you're seeing is um, a, a fundamental shift in the property rights. What were autonomous communities which had their own way of doing things and their own, own processes to allocate land. Uh, we see that uh, being taken away uh, and having operating now at state level. Uh, and there the state are really imposing uh, some of uh, th their own ownerships and claims uh, on various lands that of the indigenous people. So I the think... idea is that all land essentially kind of west of Toronto-ish, mm -hmm. right? Because that's basically where Canada essentially stopped at the time of 1763. All of that land is, is Indian hunting ground. And mm -hmm. if the crown wants any of that land, it has to negotiate with the native people in mm -hmm. a due process that would result in some kind of negotiated settlement and nobody could privately negotiate with the First Nations mm -hmm. people or the indigenous people except for the crown, except for the British government. So a, a, a trader or somebody with private property out in the boonies up in Northern Ontario can't just negotiate with First Nations people for their land. It would be illegal under the Royal Proclamation. Is that right? That's that's correct, yes. Mm. And that, that is the taking away of the greater autonomy from these local communities who mm. were free to contract with whomever they decided to. And not just contract in terms of purchase of land, but also if you think of, uh, say, for instance, um, easements, uh, that is to say permission to uh, venture onto land or to use land in some way, uh, but they retain the ownership rights. Um, e even that uh, w was up in the air a bit when it comes to the Royal Proclamation, uh, because as you say, it was exclusivity uh, that was given to the state in terms of its negotiations uh, with the indigenous population. And because this is common law, the Royal Proclamation of 1763, I mean, it's over 200 years old, but it's still in effect today, right? It's still essentially an article of law that's brought up during these kinds of land claim cases among indigenous people. That's correct. Until a piece of legislation is repealed, uh, it is still in force. And that's mm. why if uh, anyone wants to peruse uh, legal texts, you see all weird and wonderful, uh, very niche laws that may still be in effect. Uh, and that's because that no one, no government has got round to repealing it yet. So unless an act is repealed, uh, and quite often you see repealed and replaced when it comes to acts, then it is still in operation. What some courts may seek to do if it gets to dispute and you go all the way up to the, the Supreme Court is you may see the court at the time uh, distinguish or have a different interpretation of what the text says. Uh, and that can be quite common with uh, very old uh, pieces of legislation. Uh, and it quite often can seem a Houdini-like act where you think this is the literal interpretation of what the act says. 
and in order to try to orientate it to today's standards or social mores or what we perceive as being a just result today, uh, then quite often you'll see a change in interpretation. Uh, since then, you may see different pieces of legislation that will impact in some way on indigenous population, which we will see with the, the Indian Act um, and the subsequent amendments to that. Uh, but ultimately the Royal Proclamation does still stand. Yeah, I'm today. glad you mentioned the Indian Act because I'd like to get to that right now. I mean, the Royal Proclamation essentially monopolizes land or at least monopolizes land claims on behalf of the state of Canada at the time, the province of Canada, because it wasn't a nation at the time yet. The Indian Act is subsequently put into place. The Indian Act actually has antecedents, but the relevant Indian Act, I think, is the Indian Act Canada 1876. So this is the post-Confederation Indian Act, but there were prior versions of this. Uh, the Indian Act does a few things. It creates uh, reservations. It, it allows for the implementation of various kinds of mechanisms to deal with land claims. Can, just walk us through that. What does it do? Mm -hmm. uh, so the Indian Act, if you think of the Royal Proclamation as the starting point, and you have some foundational steps there when it comes to property rights and the exclusivity of negotiation, then the Indian Act also... Uh, permeates through the local community in a societal sense as well, when it comes to uh, status, when it comes to the treatment uh, of women, for instance, that was uh, a very contentious issue uh, that was only resolved in, in the 1980s, uh, when we see some future amendments. Uh, but then we look at the other various rights that the Indian Act has, and we then see, uh, in terms of uh, status of uh, what uh, constitutes status for the indigenous population and the different uh, from a hierarchical sense as well whom actually have rights and so who is an, an Indian who is an Indian is yes, what Indian exactly. status is yeah yes we, we, we see uh, one of the early attempts in legislation at a definition of what constitutes Indian whom can bring a claim under this act essentially. Uh, and even from a definitional point of view, if, if you delve into the scholarly book on that side of things, uh, there are very contentious issues even today as to whether it's under or over inclusive, the definition of Indian. Yeah, I'm wondering uh, about that because it was this definition come to, and I'm guessing the answer is no, but I'll ask it anyway, this mm. question. Was this definition of status Indian arrived at with, I suppose, deliberations, consultations with indigenous people? Initially, there will have been some form of communication consultation. Right. and consultation, yes. Um, however, we see some examples whereby either that has taken place and it's been ignored, Mm -hmm. uh, so there have been various uh, royal commissions over the years uh, and we see a series of recommendations that have been made and subsequently ignored. Uh, then uh, there are some uh, potential meaningful uh, deliberations at various points of amendments. That in, in the 1980s uh, is, is a good example of that and that was through some sort of exertion of pressure and, and certainly political pressure on the part of an indigenous population. Uh, and you see uh, some heads of communities uh, in particular, uh, akin to, to lobbying as uh, we, we would see in, in various other sectors. Um, and, and that's essentially what they've had to do. In terms of formal uh, consultation, that tends to have taken place via uh, Royal Commission and some uh, formal consultation would have been uh, done and then a report will have been issued with some recommendations. But at the time, it would have been a much more informal process. Uh, and really, it was the political will in terms of harmonisation and to get uh, them involved in greater society as the government at the time would have seen it. So the purpose of the act, the Indian Act, partly, I suppose, was to assimilate uh, 
Indian people, as they were called, into the nation state, assimilate them into a broader sense of Canada or European so-called civilization. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that, yeah. that is correct. Uh, and in doing so, yeah. Yes, and in doing so, you see that it recasts various rights and statuses of, of the indigenous population. Uh, and we can only begin to imagine uh, what that must have been like when essentially you have your own autonomy uh, and your own processes and ways of doing things. Um, and you want to keep yourselves to yourselves. And then all of a sudden we see uh, a great imposition in a legal sense, mm -hmm. uh, in a social sense and moral sense. Uh, and, and this was certainly uh, in more recent history, uh, the biggest legal and political intervention in indigenous population that, that we can think of. I'd like to talk about these two pieces of legislation. We have the Royal Proclamation of 1763, and we have the Indian Act. Let's talk about the Royal Proclamation first. Let's talk about its effects in particular on tribal sovereignty, because I'm approaching this from the point of view of a Burkean conservative. And a Burkean conservative would say, you know, this is an act or this is a piece of legislation. And as a piece of legislation, it stems, I suppose, from Canada's extension as a part of the Commonwealth of British law, British common law. A respect for rule of laws is good. Uh, respect for some kind of regularity in things is good. And conciliation is better than conflict. On the other hand, there is an undermining of tribal sovereignty. And, and we're not just, I mean, this is just, isn't just a one-sided game. This is also a game that's played with First Nations people. And, and by game, I, I don't mean that in an offhanded or flippant sense. I mean that these are also actors that have to have their interests reconciled or considered in the grand scheme of things. So the respect for institutions, the respect for rule of law is fine, but it seems that there's no real respect for tribal sovereignty or localism or local concerns. There's no subsidiarity built into the law. It's sort of a uniform position that's placed on every single indigenous group in Canada, regardless of the indigenous group's particular customs and particular history. Is that something that you would agree with? Yes, I would. And there seems to have been an assumption and a lack of understanding of local customs and, and as you describe it, uh, indigenous uh, sovereignty. And you think about how many different communities there are. If you, if you think of the, the, the most recent Royal Commission, they consulted with over 97 different communities. Wow. So you think back, back in the 1700s, just how many different indigenous communities there would have been at the time. And there is that assumption that indigenous people are one homogenous part group, of society. Yeah. Yes, what one homogenous group of people with the same perception, same views, same outlooks, same aspirations and motivations. When again, if, if you look at the literature uh, that has and research that has been done on this, you'll see that from community to community, to community it could be markedly different in terms of what the, the, the norms and the mores were uh, between different communities. And so one failing from my point of view is the lack of awareness and understanding and respect for the differences between communities in one sense. And in the other sense is how leadingly one-sided it was when it comes to negotiating, negotiating power uh, and bargaining power. And you think that the state had the great weight in that uh, and was able to exert its power and influence uh, in a much more effective way than indigenous population were at the time. Mm. Uh, th there was no attempt really to uh, have, uh, as you described it, some sort of protection for the different communities, personal autonomy and, and sovereignty. Uh, and there was a much greater imposition uh, of uniformity uh, and assimilation uh, with the greater society at the time. And it was almost as if a sort of we know best attitude, if you mm -hmm. like, that we have perfected 
what we consider the, the optimum way of approaching uh, legal processes and rights. And you're going to have to follow that now collectively. Uh, yeah, and that with was no the other grand floor. for the evolution of their own particular communities, in fact. So, Richard, we were talking about the Indian Act and we were talking about the Royal Proclamation. It sounds like the Royal Proclamation, we're already kind of off to a bad start because we're not keeping in mind the heterogeneity of these various communities of indigenous peoples across Canada and across British North America, as it was called in those days. Looking at the Indian Act, and the way it delineates powers, is it true, is it fair to say that essentially all Indian affairs and everything indigenous communities kind of want to do, and they're ultimately in the hands of Ottawa, the federal government, in many ways? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, and bear in mind that the federal vote wasn't given until 1960 to the indigenous population. Really? So it wasn't, a, yes, it wasn't as if uh, the indigenous population could try to uh, shift, make some shift in change uh, in, in terms of the traditional voting sense at the federal level. Uh, and you, you have a lot of power that resides uh, with, with government. Uh, there are two other ways potentially that you can see issues being resolved and some, some uh, uh, influence being exerted. Uh, one way is through the courts, that where there are disputes or legal challenges to uh, what any piece of legislation may say or give effect to, mm. then you can pursue that through the courts and, and make a legal challenge, whether that's by uh, challenging the actual act itself or wanting a different interpretation or wanting to distinguish from prior case law. Uh, you can do that, and that's at your, your disposal through the courts. And then the other possibility is we've seen various special committees set up, which are act as a sort of facilitating of opinion and views between Indigenous people and the government at the time. And that's had varying levels of, of success throughout the years in terms of the recommendations that have been put forward and whether or not they have been acted upon. Yeah, and the Indian Act, I think it had a kind of persistent effect, even up until 1985. I'm reading here of subsection 12.1b of the Act, <laughs> discriminated against Indian women by stripping them and their descendants of their Indian status if they married a man without Indian status. So if an Indian woman marries, I suppose, a European man or even a non-European man who's not indigenous, she would lose her indigenous status and her children would lose their indigenous status. They would fail to be part of the community anymore under the provisions of the act, or at least mm -hmm. under the act itself. So I guess the idea was essentially to assimilate them through breeding, mm -hmm. just to put it quite uh, bluntly, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. And I don't think that's a controversial thing to say when you look at yeah. what the stated aims and mm -hmm. objectives were by various people uh, in charge at the time. And one of the stated goals was precisely to assimilate. And one way you do that is make it very difficult for the continuation of status. And this was, as you describe it, a, a discriminatory aspect of the act towards women, uh, that through no fault of their own, uh, they may want to uh, marry someone without that heritage uh, and yet retain uh, or at least in elements, in part, uh, some of their own heritage. And, and that wasn't respected uh, whatsoever, as you say, uh, uh, prior uh, to the late uh, 80s. Uh, and uh, there are other aspects uh, of this which you could see the slow uh, diminution of uh, rights and statuses in an attempt to uh, assimilate them and uh, essentially reduce the population of, of the indigenous communities in that mm. sense. That's uh, something I don't think that most Canadians know about, and it has a pronounced effect on everything that we talk about today when we're talking about, for example, indigenous land rights. So when it comes to indigenous land rights, there are big 
projects, pipelines in particular, that mm -hmm. have become a contentious issue across the prairies and across much of Canada. Uh, can you just remark a little bit about these pipelines? I mean, you know, as Canadians, I think, especially for those of us who live in cities, the only time we come across this issue is when we're affronted with the news and the news tells us, oh, there are these pipeline protests, right? They're blockading trains, for example. They were blockading trains back, I think, in November or December uh, for this particular issue because they claimed that these pipelines were going over native land and frequently these native peoples claim that they weren't properly consulted on the actual issue of the pipelines. Yes, and the government of the day, their approach seems to be if we uh, line their hands with a bit of gold, then the issue will go away. Yeah. But that is to completely miss the point. Uh, th there are two points on this, I think. Uh, one is uh, the initial consultation in the first place, and the granting of some sort of permission. Uh, usually it would be the case that whomever the landholder is, that you would need permission uh, if you wanted to have uh, any transport links or mm -hmm. some sort of uh, resource going through the land. But uh, hang on, can't the government, so from what I understand, it, this is a US concept, eminent domain, allows the government to essentially requisition land with due compensation for something like yes. a highway. Is there some kind of analog in common law, in British common law? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, over in the UK, we have compulsory purchase orders. And uh, with what's going on with our uh, major transport link called HS2, uh, what, and one of the big legal issues has been precisely that, is the purchasing and acquiring of the land mm. that is necessary yeah. to extend and build this uh, train network. Uh, and it's, it, it will be a similar, as you say, analogue uh, in Canada, whereby you would have to have adequate compensation given if you're compulsory, compulsory putting a purchase order on it. Uh, in order to put, in this case, a pipeline uh, through the land. But in the um, case of indigenous land, it's not the same because indigenous land is essentially governed by the Indian Act. It's not like private yes. land that you can just give money to and then waltz on mm -hmm. over. Yes, and, and that's the principle at stake here because they mm -hmm. have treated it, the government, as if it is just another piece of private land that they can uh, have some sort of small settlement. And usually the settlements, uh, when you think about them, they ignore the, the value to, to the people uh, who own it at the time. And so you see the, the, the lowest end of the estimate in terms of market value often being given for these types of projects anyway. But as you say, uh, it is to be distinguished between indigenously held land and other private uh, land that exists. And to treat it uh, exa in exactly the same way has caused a lot of understandable unrest uh, and challenge and protest about this. Yeah, and I think it's important, you know, especially for a lot of Canadian urbanites, the Laurentian elite, you know, you guys have your own elite in England, you have the nobility, we have our own nobility, they're called the Laurentian elite, they're the kinds of old families who live along the banks of the St. Lawrence, and they kind of run Canada. Uh, Justin Trudeau is an example of them. Our finance minister, Bill Morneau, is an example of them. The fact is that this elite, they'll kind of have a tendency, because they don't live among these communities, they probably have never interacted with an indigenous person in their life, to have a tendency to romanticize the native and tend to think, oh, mm -hmm. you know, they, it's, it's all about the environment, man. It's all about... Um, from, from what I can see and from talking to indigenous people that I've known, um, there are a variety of views. I mean, indigenous people have, are, are people like us. They have a variety of views. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think one common trend that I've noticed is, is exactly what you're talking about, this lack of consultation and deliberation. A lot of indigenous people want development. They want oil and gas development. A lot of them work in the oil and gas sector. They work in the natural resource extraction sectors in Canada. A lot of them don't necess aren't necessarily against natural resource extraction. I think the point exactly that you make is that there has to be consultation and it has to be done in a way that's responsible and doesn't just sort of undercut these communities and treat them as if it's sort of a private property deal that you would do like if you were building a highway through my house, for example. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, and that forms part of the assimilation view of governments, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, in treating them the same. It ignores the history and the treaties uh, and the legislation that exists, which do apply to, to that part of the population. And it's yet another example of, of this prevailing assimilation view of we, we, what's the harm and what's the issue in treating such people as we would other citizens, mm -hmm. uh, which is very harmful from a, a principal point of view. And, and as you pointed out, that many people are in favour uh, of expanding resources uh, and having such extraction uh, that, that can help and uh, help develop certain areas. Uh, but you can't just go to the end part in this. There are processes oh, there through are. which you have to adhere to. Um, and just because you don't like the process doesn't mean that you can just flagrantly ignore it. And unfortunately, that seems to have been the position of, of the government uh, and of the Trudeau uh, administration uh, is to ignore that process. And yeah. rightfully, uh, that has uh, angered uh, an enraged part of the indigenous population. Yeah, it's ironic because much of Trudeau's support in 2015, and I remember this vividly, was from First Nations indigenous people. And I think the second election that he, I mean, he didn't really win a UK, it's a minority government, right? So the Liberals won a minority. I just noticed a lot of the initial sentiment and the initial enthusiasm behind Trudeau had evaporated uh, particularly among these communities, because as you say, there's no change, really. There's no substantive mm -hmm. change uh, along the lines of these issues. Um, so, so let's talk about uh, discrimination. Let's talk about mm -hmm. Indigenous people today in the light of discrimination. Uh, this is, I think, an issue. I was trying to look for research on this. I haven't actually managed to find any good research like has been done in other countries on this issue. And I think actually that this is a big area that scholars can contribute to is research on issues of indigenous discrimination in Canada. Uh, because it's easy to cite stats, for example, the fact that indigenous people are overrepresented in prisons, for example, in penitentiaries in Canada. But to really get at the heart of what's underlying that issue is something that scholars need to delve into. There is a lot of self-reported feelings of discrimination among Indigenous people here, and there are even anecdotal instances that I can point to. Uh, so let's talk about, about this issue of discrimination and, and what can be done uh, about it. What's your take on this, Richard? So in terms of discrimination, I think there are three main points to make. First of all is in the legal sense. Uh, and uh, the two elements to this is you have direct discrimination and indirect discrimination. Right. And so if, if we think of it in, let's say, hypothetically, in the realm of employment law yeah. and whether or not someone... Uh, from the indigenous population it is employed and their employer uh, may do uh, or say certain things uh, that can either directly discriminate or indirectly discriminate against said worker and then when it comes to employment tribunal um, they would seek to distinguish between the two. Um, the other point about discrimination is the more general uh, issue of discrimination and we can think of this in, in the abstract um, and one instructive way to think about discrimination, uh, I think, is um, Marion uh, Free's uh, idea of the, the birdcage of oppression theory, as it's known. And she makes the, the compelling argument that if we think of isolated incidents uh, and uh, someone may dismiss that and say that's purely anecdotal uh, and that it's an isolated incident and how can it possibly affect the group as a whole just because there are a few uh, rude people um, whom have expressed uh, uh, an attitude of, of dislike uh, or hatred towards a member of that population. But in t according to this uh, Burke Age of Oppression theory, uh, each incident represents a bar on the birdcage. So if you put mm. 
a bird in an empty bird cage. The bird can fly out and roam freely. And then you start putting a bar on and then another bar and another bar. And it's the culmination of many different bars that, are mean, that means that the bird is eventually trapped. And we can think of this in terms of hate speech or even just societal attitudes towards a particular group, that it's the collective incidents and collective views over time that builds this oppression and discrimination against a certain group uh, in society. Uh, and relatedly, the, the, the other idea that I think is also useful to think about is, uh, this comes from Jeremy Waldron, one of uh, his works is, is the hate and hate speech, and in it he talks about the various elements of dignity, and it's actually dignity that is being assaulted uh, by hate speech. And one element of dignity, according to Waldron, is this idea of uh, inclusivity, which is a felt security, as he describes it, that you can go around your day-to-day -day life free of interference. And whenever you encounter, whether it be graffiti on a wall, uh, a message of hatred online, uh, or uh, a horrible encounter in a shop when you're trying to buy something or take your children to school, uh, all of these things in some way harm uh, and assault uh, the dignity uh, of a, a group of people. Uh, so I think, I think they're, the, they're, they're the useful points, I but, think, to make uh, in the What abstract. is to be done about... I definitely think direct discrimination can be addressed and it should be addressed directly and the perpetrators of such discrimination should have to face a court of law, especially mm -hmm. in cases where they cost somebody their employment or their physical security or even their lives in some cases or the lives of their families. I'm not so sure about what to do about indirect discrimination because first of all to me it seems like the way you're describing it first of all it's hard to measure it's very difficult for us to say what would be any kind of compensatory or punitive damages that the legal system can confer to the victims of this kind of indirect discrimination and it seems like if you were to try to prevent this kind of discrimination by legislation you could end up ostensibly trampling upon certain civil liberties and freedoms that we take for granted in the Western societies, Western liberal democracies. So you talk about hate speech. Waldron, I know he talks about hate speech. And if you start to say, for example, make laws against hate speech, you start to impede upon freedom of speech itself, right? And mm -hmm. then you, you get into this whole cycle of, okay, who decides what is hate speech? Is it the mm -hmm. judge? And, you know, doesn't the definition of hate speech change depending on the context and blah, blah, blah. Yes. You get into all of these issues. Uh, where would you take this in terms of a balance to be found in terms of legislation? Uh, yes, I, I think you hit upon the, the, the right point here. Uh, direct discrimination can be dealt with uh, and is routinely dealt with. But uh, as you point out, often that will only deal with the actual incident itself. What it can't combat is the wider discriminatory view uh, or derogatory view that a society may have against a, a group of its people. And the issue then becomes uh, the conflict between different liberties and rights and how best to balance them. Uh, and as you also point out about, okay, let's regulate hate speech type of arguments, and uh, that, that's a different rabbit hole to go down. But you rightfully say uh, that there are uh, issues with that and the interference with free speech uh, and the price to pay in that. So the question then becomes how best uh, can, can we deal with this? Uh, and I think you can take di different approaches to this. It doesn't have to just be a singular silver bullet to, to the issue. And I don't think one uh, exists in any event. And you must have uh, the legal support and recognition uh, and have the rights bolstered of that vulnerable group of society, so indigenous people. And I think a, a revisitation of the most recent uh, Royal Commission set of uh, recommendations would be a very positive first step because then you are 
including the many communities that participated and engaged with that commission. You are also engaging with some of the leading experts and scholars in the field. Uh, and then it's also a, a very big show of support as well in terms of a political will uh, behind that. So start listening to the, to the communities, uh, revisit uh, the, the numerous recommendations that were made and subsequently uh, no action was taken uh, to uh, enact. Uh, and then you can start thinking about the, the other issues such as uh, education and day-to-day -day interactions in terms of different sectors and parts of society. And I'm aware that there is currently some disparity between the UK laws on speech and, and what uh, Canada has in terms of its regulation of speech. And we yeah, can see to be that honest in Canada. Uh, with you, Richard, I think Canada is a bit more free than the UK. Uh, yes, I, I think in, in certain aspects, you, you're right, there are. Um, there are a few notable exceptions when, yeah. in terms of regulation of speech, which perhaps we can, we can discuss another time. Uh, so I think certainly uh, have uh, the, the legal recognition uh, and revisit the uh, commission uh, and have some hints to the Indian Act uh, if they're deemed necessary uh, and could be proved uh, to be effective. Something that I've noticed, you know, you mentioned you framed this entire discussion at the start in the context of human rights. And mm -hmm. human rights uh, for conservatives is often something that's associated with the left, right? Oh, they're all about human rights. But as a conservative, I think you can look at the history of this legislation. You can look at the way it's developed and you can look at the fact that these are local communities and you can say to yourself, okay, you know, there is something maybe wrong here and maybe there's something I can agree upon with the left, but coming at it from a different premise. And the different premise would be the focus on legislation, the focus on rule of law, due process, conciliation, as opposed to conflict, you know, not just treating people as commodities here, here's a little bit of gold and go away. And also a focus on really localism, on local communities, on local traditions, on local customs. There seems to be a conservative case for caring about these kinds of indigenous issues and claims to land that current Canadian conservatives, to be quite frank, are lacking in their outlook. I agree with that. I think human rights generally have in some quarters a terrible stigma attached to them. It raises a red flag as soon as you mention the word human rights because they think of something terrible or insufferable that is going to be yeah. reached in the courts and uh, generally from the UK perspective it's usually the European Court of Human Rights which uh, has, a, has a bad reputation for that. Uh, but ultimately it's something we should all care about because we are all affected in all sorts of ways through having our own protection of human rights. And we all have that incentive to ensure uh, that those remain in place, that those safeguards and checks and balances are in place, uh, so that we don't have to confront some Orwellian nightmare, yeah. some horrible authoritarian regime that tramples all over our rights in, in all manner of ways. and. Yeah. We should therefore care when some part of community, even one that we don't belong to necessarily, uh, we should care if their rights are being infringed and interfered with. Uh, and we should support that cause, uh, absolutely. Especially when they're being infringed upon by an agent that is ostensibly acting on behalf of the Crown, which is our sovereign. Yes. I mean, uh, I, I, know, I know you're, you're, you're a Republican, so <laughs> I mean, you're, ultimately you're going to disagree. Yes. But, but just a priori, we have to start with the same assumption. We are both mm. under the sovereign, which is the Queen of England. Yes. Yes, whether we like it or not, Republican or monarchist, uh, yeah. the result is exactly the same in terms of the reality of the situation is. Uh, we can talk about how ceremonial it is, but ultimately, f from a constitutional point of view, yes, uh, it is uh, the, the monarch uh, whom is at the top of, of sovereignty. Uh, and uh, 
whether that's a good or bad thing can be debated, but the, the point remains and the fact remains that, that that is the case. Yeah. I don't want to leave with a kind of sour note. I do think, I don't know if you will agree, but I think in many ways things have become better for Indigenous people in Canada over time. Their rights have been granted to them, which were previously denied them, the right to vote, the right to suffrage, the right to be recognized as an Indigenous person if you're a woman. And now there are more people recognized as Indigenous persons under more recent legislation. I think that's a very good assessment of the situation. And certainly, uh, although we can criticise elements of legislation as they stand today, uh, we can chastise government for infringing on land uh, and also for not enacting various recommendations uh, that the, the communities would seek. But there have been some positive winds of change. Uh, there have been uh, developments, and you outlined s some of the very notable ones. Uh, and I think that given the current context and the current political climate, there is more attention now being drawn to the outstanding issues for Indigenous rights. And they do remain the group arguably most discriminated against in Canada today. Yeah, I would say uh, so. And the more attention it's receiving, the better. And I hope for a greater dialogue uh, and communication uh, with group leaders uh, and with, with relevant experts. And hopefully uh, that can resolve some of the outstanding issues. Yeah, and education, kind of like what we're trying to do now, is important as well. I mean, I don't think a lot of Canadians are aware of these issues, especially if they live in cities or especially if they're recently arrived Canadians who have no idea of the historical context. It's very important to kind of try and understand a little bit about it. And I think we've been trying to present it in as dispassionate and nuanced a way as we possibly can with the limited time that we have been able to. So I'd like to actually thank you, Richard. This has been fascinating to me, and I hope it's fascinating to my viewers and listeners. I'm sure it will be. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, Cornelius. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, and it's also been extremely insightful uh, what comments and assessments that you've made. Uh, and I look forward to our next chat. Me too. I look forward to it as well. Cheers.